So welcome folks, there's still a couple more people to arrive, but I think we'll just get started with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, okay, welcome very much to um, my studio in Queensferry, South Queensferry, which is um, on the River Forth, on the Firth of Forth, just beside the, the, um, the Forth Bridge. So that's a kind of iconic landmark just outside Edinburgh. Um, I have a home studio and uh, I'm going to do the talk from here tonight. I've got some photographs that I can share with you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's behind the work in the exhibition that's on at the moment at Edinburgh Palette. The exhibition is called On Tree Time and uh, you can view it online. I'm also doing virtual tours and you can view it in person as well if you're near Edinburgh. So <clears throat> just like to welcome you. Welcome to, um, to just outside Edinburgh for the artist talk about on tree time. Okay, um, just a little bit of housekeeping first of all. I am recording this, um, this artist talk and I will be putting it on YouTube later because there are some people who are not able to attend. So the, um, uh, you'll be able to see when you join the meeting that it's being recorded. Um, you are very welcome to put your video on if you would like to. It's always quite nice to see people's faces, but I totally understand if you'd rather not do that, if you're a bit shy, but um, it, it would be really nice to see you. Christiane, nice to see you. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it feels a bit lonely talking to a blank screen, and I know we all have this experience too, don't we? I see Shona there as well. Hi. <laughs> so, yeah, it's nice to see some human faces as well. <clears throat> that helps keep me going. Hi Heather, that's good. Let's say uh, that's nice to see you. So you don't have to don't have to show yourselves. Um, it's probably easiest if you're on mute at the moment. Uh, what I plan to do is talk for about kind of 40, 45 minutes, and then we can have um, a kind of QA session if you want. Um, usually that kind of five minutes after I talk, nobody can think of any questions, and then they think of them all at the last five minutes. So if you have questions as we're going along please just put them in the chat and I will see them there and I'll try and kind of answer, uh, answer any questions that we get. Um, okay, so uh, I am, um, we've still got somebody joined here. Let's see if I've got folks, folks coming in. Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome. So I'm just going to repeat myself a little bit there just to say that we're recording uh, this meeting and I'm going to be putting it on YouTube later for people that are not able to attend live. Um, so just to let you know that um, you're very welcome to put your video on if you would like to um, show your face and a uh, cup of tea or whatever it is that you've got. Um, please keep your audio off just now. And if you've got any questions, just um, write that in the chat and I'll be able to answer the questions at the end of the talk. OK. Um, a little bit of context then. So I'm a, I'm an artist. I um, I've always been, I've always regarded myself as an artist, but I've done lots of other things as well. I've been a puppeteer, I've been a community development worker, um, lots of different sorts of jobs, um, but I'm a full-time artist and um, I teach drawing as well now. So th uh, that's that's what I do all day. Um, I work from a home studio just outside Edinburgh in um, Queensferry. I think the first thing that I'll do is just give you a, a little roam around the studio. So I've got, um, I've got a second camera, which I will spotlight for you because um, I don't know about you, but I love seeing inside other people's studios and seeing all the nooks and crannies. So I'll give you a little bit of a tour around. You might not be able to hear me very well because I have uh, two devices here, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, so here we are. Here we are. I'm filming me, filming me, filming. Wow, that's a bit um, mind boggling. Okay, this is my kind of desk space. So this is where I do my sort of thinking, sketchbooky things, some admin things. So this is where um, I can sit and I can look out the window and I can watch the birds and the squirrels and pigeons fighting, etc. which is very nice. Here are all my um, art books and books about trees and books about the landscape and history. Uh, and some art materials. 
So it looks quite neat and tidy, actually. Yeah, it is fairly neat and tidy, that bit. I like to know where everything is. I'm quite organised. Um, the studio at the moment is quite tidy, but that's because um, I'm in a kind of exhibiting phase, so there isn't an awful lot of uh, art materials around. This is my um, kind of mind map wall. This is where all my influences and, and kind of ideas about how my work develops, that's where I make a note of them. So you can see it's in a sort of tree form. That's, um, that's really just the way that I think. So I have that right next to where my main kind of desk space is because that's a good space for working. So I will take you through. So on the other side, this is my storage area where I have framed works, all the other kind of random things that you need in a studio, panels, canvases, etc. And then my collection of pieces of wood, fantastic bits of bark, things that I've picked up as I've been out in the woods, obligatory skull, all artist studios seem to have one of those, I think. Um, I have uh, a few things up on the, on the studio wall at the moment, if I step back and show you those. Um, so this isn't work that I'm currently working on, again, because I'm doing a kind of exhibiting at the moment. Um, these are things that I've um, just kind of had that are prompting me maybe for whatever's coming next. So this piece is one which precedes some of the work that's in the exhibition. Likewise, this one, which is a phoenix tree. And I have some um, live drawings here. So I, I, I do live drawing via Zoom at the moment quite regularly. This is um, one of my chapels framed from my veteran series. Here, you can just sort of see that behind. That's my, um, my kind of board that I have next to where I draw. So on that board, I have um, notes of things that I know kind of concepts, things that I want to keep in my mind as I draw. And then this is my main making space. So this drawing board here, which is a full sheet of plywood with some rails and things attached. That's where I spend most of my time actually drawing. I have a corner of the studio with um, reference images, not particular to any project, but images which have stayed with me over years, really. Things which are, are kind of core themes, relate to those core themes, I would say. You just see a plate there which has charcoal powder on, which is material that I use a lot and um, dip my hand into it. I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Here is a slightly untidy trolley. Um, it's got a mixture of ink things, oil painting things, sanguine dry media. That's where I keep up my brushes and things. Okay, and I have a fantastic big plant chest. I love that plant chest. That is, if I can just open that up. There we go. So you can see there. So um, all my works on paper, once completed, will be stored in that plan chest. Okay. So we'll come back here and I will take that chair off so you can see me. All right, we need spotlight. And Okay, so you've had a little tour. Um, that's my studio. Um, now I will tell you a little bit more about the exhibition. So um, the exhibition on tree time is made up of just over 40 works, which I have been working on since kind of October last year. So uh, yeah, about kind of seven, eight months or so. But um, all the bodies of work in on tree time relate and follow on from works that I've done in the past as well. So you will see that in the photographs that I put up. Um, you can see the exhibition online. It's on my website um, and you can see it virtually. So um, I'm doing virtual tours for people who would like um, maybe a conversation with me about the work and would just like to be able to get up close and see it. Um, and you can also visit it in person if you're near Edinburgh. It's on an Edinburgh Palette, which is in St Margaret's House to the east side of Edinburgh, if anybody knows that area. 
Okay, let's share the screen and share the photo. So hopefully everybody can see that. Right, um, I'm starting off with an image that's um, perhaps a little bit confusing because it doesn't directly relate to anything that's in the exhibition. But um, I thought for this talk, it would be really interesting not just to pick finished works and talk about them because you can see those already on the, um, on the uh, online exhibition and on the walls. I think, um, I think it's, it, it's good to be able to explain a little bit about the process of how art gets made. And um, often it's not something that you're aware of as an artist while you're actually doing it. It's, um, it's something which when it comes to reviewing that you think, oh, right, okay, yes, now I understand where those ideas came from. So in preparing the talk, I realized that these um, monoprints, which are pretty scrappy, quick kind of playthings, were actually a precursor to the Rivers of Oak series that I made in charcoal. Um, these are based on, um, they're inspired by rather, um, ancient oak trees in uh, a place called Dalkeith Country Park, which is just to the south of Edinburgh. There's a large collection of um, ancient oaks. It used to be many, many centuries ago, it was a hunting forest. And there are oaks which are known to be at least 600 years old, and there are hundreds of them. So it's a really special place. And it's a location that I've been drawing for a long time. I've been making the kind of work that I make at the moment for about 10 or 12 years. Um, I've been exhibiting for 10 years, 10 years in, in November this year. Um, and Dalkeith um, Old Oaks is one of the very first locations that I found that really inspired me to start um, drawing and photographing these kind of old trees, but also finding out more about why they're there. Why do they look like that? You know, what is it that's special about them? So that's you know, a place that's really kind of started me on my, my journey towards um, understanding ancient trees more. You can see there that they have, um, they have a mixture of dead and living wood. So they have parts of the tree which has bark on it and parts which don't. And the parts which don't, as you can see here on the left hand side, you can um, you can see the, the, the wood underneath. Now, the thing that really struck me about these was the way it looked as if the, the, the wood was flowing. Um, I have called the exhibition on tree time because really what I want to get across is this idea that I am, you know, I live, you know, as humans, we live at a very different, um, a different pace. We have a very different lifetime compared to an ancient tree. If, if this tree has lived 600 years, it might well live another 400. I'm just a tiny little blip in that tree's life. And really what I was trying to imagine while I was making this work was um, what if I could do a time lapse that lasted for 600 years? What if I could see in a few minutes the way that the tree moved and turned uh, and formed and flowed if I could actually see that. So that, that, that's the kind of concept that I was trying to get um, into the work was this idea that, sorry, go back, this idea that, um, that the wood flows. Um, this image, um, I haven't put a lot of kind of reference images in, but this really represents a whole kind of um, thread of inspiration for me. Uh, I actually studied three-dimensional design uh, my, that was my degree rather than fine art. So I did wood, metal, ceramics, glass, um, making things with your hands. <clears throat> so a very sculptural kind of approach. And I think my drawing has quite a sculptural quality to it. Um, and it, it's significant that on my studio walls, there's lots of those sorts of images where you know, we know that that's stone, we know it's marble, but it looks as if it's flowing too. So that's the sort of thing that, that's also fed into the, into the work. This is a drawing which I made um, inspired by those old oaks at Dalkeith. Um, what would this be? Six, nearly seven years ago now. So quite a long time ago. And uh, I only did a few at the time. It was so it was a little bit like a, um, the seeds of an idea that I didn't really have the time or the energy at that time to pursue in a bigger series. 
So this was one of the things that was in my mind when I, I you know, last autumn, I thought this is what I want to do for my next um, project. The other aspect um, of the, the kind of flowing thing that is fairly new for me is that I'm a member of the Coastal Rowing Club here in Queen's Ferry. Um, I don't know if those of you who are outside Scotland are aware of this, but um, it's a movement that started in Scotland but has spread all over the world. Communities build their own boats um, and, uh, and row on the sea. So that's something that I started doing about three years ago. As you can see there, there's the fourth bridge there's the fourth rail bridge there, there's the fourth road bridge as well. Um, and what that's meant is that I have, now I've got more of an understanding about how water works. I grew up in Derbyshire, which is about as far from the sea as you can get um, in England. So being beside the sea is still quite a novelty for me. Um, and, I, and I didn't realize the influence that this had had in the work until after I made the work, but I can see now that the the knowledge, the kind of visual, visual knowledge that I have, the visual memory that I have about how water behaves has fed into um, my charcoal works. Uh, it's also a nice chance just to show you a, a lovely picture of the bridges and the sea. So I hope you enjoy that. And the other thing um, that will kind of become plain and talk over that is um, my Rivers of Oak series of charcoals have watery titles uh, and if you if you see the kind of imagery, the way that that flows, this is the, th these are the sorts of things that I was trying to capture in the charcoals as well. Okay. And other things that fed in, um, uh, I had a little trip up to Olapool to take some work up to an exhibition um, last autumn and uh, found these wonderful patterns on the beach. I think they were probably, you know, maybe uh, there, there were seams of very dark rock and the sand had layered uh, and, it, and it very much reminded me of charcoal. And I, and I put that image in because it made me realise how little there was to feed into creative practice at that time. Well, obviously, I know our, our travel was restricted, um, our social interaction was restricted. I'm very lucky to be able to have my studio at home and I could keep working, but um, you know, I was really hungry for new images, for novelty, for, for, for different things. So I think that's why you know, that, that was one of the things that stuck out as feeding into the work. And the other thing, now, to my shame, I don't have a reference for this, for this um, photographer's name, but um, this photograph kind of sums up a little bit of those thoughts that I have about how, um, how trees effectively represent solidified time. Um, try and explain that a little bit better. So this photographer has um, used the camera to take multiple images to track the flight path of the birds. And what I am trying to do um, when I'm drawing the trees is to get an idea, keep that idea in my mind of the gesture of the way that the way that the wood has grown. It's a fantastic photograph. I need to find out who did that. Um, life drawing is also something that's really um, important to my practice. I don't in any way claim that the life drawings that I've put, put in this um, little presentation represent um, the best that I can do or anything that I'm particularly proud of. But um, what I really enjoy is working really fast from quite short poses and uh, uh, where, the, where the model's moving around because it's the gesture again that I enjoy. Uh, and you probably see um, when you look at my work that there's definitely an influence of, um, of the figure and of life drawing in the, um, in the work that I make. So to talk about the, the process of making the, um, firstly, the, the Rivers of Oak. So the exhibition on Two Time has three bodies of work. It has my charcoal Rivers of Oak. It has my Phoenix trees, which are the um, paintings in oil and oil pastel and soft pastel. And then it has my woodland drawings, which are, um, most of those are done in uh, sanguine, which is kind of reddish um, dry material. And those are done in front of the tree. So those are actually done in the woodland. And um, just to give you an idea about how the process starts, it starts with the sketchbook. It starts with doodling. And uh, these are very doodly. I will, um, use thumbnails 
So these are not necessarily plans for work. These are just me kind of testing what's going to work. Um, thinking about the composition, just uh, trying to soak up all the information that I've got from visiting the trees, from drawing them, from photographing them, and then processing that. Um, I'll just kind of scrub through that. I won't make you sit and watch that, but it's just an idea about how the how those drawings first begin. So I've not got a plan here. I'm not actually working from anything in particular. Um, this is really filtering what I have in my mind, in my memory, and what I'm trying to work towards. So it's, it's the start of that kind of synthesizing process that happens in the sketchbook. Um, and, I'll, and I'll keep doing that until I've got some things that are moving more towards a composition. So I do put quite a lot of time into, um, into working up compositions. Um, and that's partly because it's a part of the process that I enjoy, but also because I work um, these for, with charcoal and I want to keep a kind of freshness to the finished work. I don't want, to, I don't want it to be overworked. I don't want it to be you know, kind of constantly erased and put back. I, I want it to stay quite fresh. So if you like, these are rehearsals for, um, for, the, for the larger scale work. Um, so I make a lot of the decisions about what the final work is going to look like at this stage. There's still lots to surprise me, but um, that's really what these are. Yeah, I would say I would say that they're kind of like rehearsals. And sometimes, you know, there'll be one that jumps out. You think, oh, that, that looks exciting. I'll, I'll take that one further. And there'll be others that you just, you know, feel a bit flat about at the time, but maybe go back to a year later. Who knows? That, that's what the wonderful thing about sketchbooks. So following on from that, from that kind of stage in the sketchbook, um, then move to using charcoal. Uh, so you can see at the bottom there, I've got lots of reference photos of the, um, the trees. They're all the oaks in Dalkeith. Um, and I started just playing about on a slightly larger scale with the charcoal powder um, and charcoal, um, fine charcoal, charcoal sticks to um, just to have a go at what, what might work. Uh, okay, there we go. So that's the corner of my studio that I showed you at the beginning, just in case um, some of you come a little bit later. Um, this is the... Um, this is the, the kind of main workspace. So you can see here that I've got my reference material that, um, that's there all the time. I've got my charcoal and things here, just on my right hand, I'm right-handed. I've got some reference photos. I've got some sketchbooks uh, and all that information kind of filters in. Um, and that's a close-up of the, uh, the whiteboard that I showed you at the beginning, which has um, just the 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 thoughts the <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> the thoughts the ideas that pop into my head the kind of guiding statements sometimes they don't lend themselves to um to being verbalized but when they do pop into my head that's where i write them and i've found over the years that um that's really helpful to work in a series and produce, uh, so with this particular series with the Rivers of Oak, I think I made, I think I made about 16. Um, there's, let's see, there's nine in the exhibition. I think I made about 16. <clears throat> and it helps to create a coherent body of work if I've got a sort of, you know, consistent ideas that are in my head at the time. And, you know, some of these are just notes to myself. Uh, okay. Uh, it's a close-up of some of my materials. Um, those of you who are artists might recognise some of those, but I'll uh, talk you through what they are. So I use charcoal powder quite a lot. Um, that's a very versatile material. You can use it wet, but um, at the moment I'm using it um, completely dry. So there's no water or medium involved in these works. Um, they are paper and charcoal. That's it. Uh, I've got a selection of different sorts of charcoal here. I use brushes and then I use other tools. So I use uh, sham, chamois leather cut into different kind of um, 
shapes and textures. I use feathers, I use sticks, all sorts of things really. I'm, I'm constantly trying to um, experiment and find new, new tools for mark making. So these are all the sorts of things that I would use to uh, make the marks. And that's a close up of some of the, uh, the chamois leather tools. I think that's shortly after I put them in the wash. So they look quite clean. So they're all natural materials and, and uh, it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision, but that's something which feels right for the work to, to, have, to have natural materials. I also, I don't think I put it in, I don't think I put it in. I also use um, charcoal tapes to a long stick, basically make, give myself a six foot arm so I can stand back from the work and still draw. That's a lot of fun, um, but it also gives you really interesting marks. So I do, I do finger painting, really, that's what that is. That's a lot of fun. Um, but it also means that you get that gesture, you get that freshness um, that I was talking about earlier. So this is the, that, that body of work progressing. The, you can see the, at the top here were the first, um, the first kind of trials. And then here was my kind of scaling up and refining. So this is the first gestural layer. These are not finished. That's a finished one. So if I go back and point that out to you, I hopefully you can see my cursor here. This one turned into this one. I just put those brushes there to give you an idea of the scale. So um, hopefully you can see it's a very, it's a very gestural thing. It's not trying to be a tree portrait. I'm, I'm not interested in doing a tree portrait as such. I'm trying to capture the feeling of the of the life of the tree the kind of the energy and the flow of it but it also looks like other things you know it could be it, it could be water it could be coral it could be animal it could be ghostly all sorts of different things it, being in the exhibition over the last week or so has been really interesting listening to people's um people's responses to them because they always come up with something that i didn't imagine uh, this is, uh, I'll just keep play that while I talk, to give you a little bit of an insight into how I start applying the charcoal. So you can see there that I'm using a feather, dip, dip the feather into the charcoal. That makes some really lovely marks. I use my hands, the heel of my hand. Uh, I use putty rubber. That's me just kind of blowing off some of the excess. And these I started horizontal. And then what I'll do is I'll move that to the vertical drawing board and then that will enable me to start working into it and I will work um, I I'll work kind of by addition and subtraction so if I play that little time lapse there if only it was this fast I mean it takes days but <laughs> it's um, it looks like it's a speedy process so you can see there that now you know I've, I'm using some of those tools to remove some charcoal and then using charcoal to add back some uh, some dark areas and some depth. So there's a constant kind of backwards and forwards to um, to get the effects that I want. Uh, and really what I'm trying to do with these is get a very strong form, get a really um, kind of powerful sense of it being a solid thing, but also keeping it ambiguous. Uh, so you'll see that I'm not putting roots. It's not it's not set in the context of a landscape. It's um, it's kind of floating uh, so that's a deliberate thing and that's the finished that's the finished work and that one's called falls which um i'm delighted to say i, I sold i uh, sold today so i got an email today to say that um somebody wanted to buy that um I, she's a kayaker and she recognized the the kind of the swirls that those the forms of the water there um so it was a lovely connection uh, so you can see close up here where I've um, you know, allowed some of the, char the splatter of the charcoal powder to remain. And uh, let's see a little bit more about the detail. So there's sort of sharp marks and soft marks as well. And that's the finished piece. Um, just quickly show you those. And that's really just kind of panning across the series as they are reaching the end of the gesture stage. So in painting terms, that would be the underpainting. Um, and it was great to be able to put them all up on the studio wall and review them, uh, look at the strengths, weaknesses, make adjustments at this stage as a whole set. 
and there they are in some larger scale ones here at the bottom as well there that are in the exhibition sometimes um sometimes it doesn't work and this is what i have to do and i tried really hard to make that one work but it just wouldn't uh, so i put that in because i wanted to show you how easy it is to change charcoal until it's fixed you can just keep moving it around like that that um that didn't make it out of the studio i'm afraid that got turned into scrap paper and then here's some of the um the works when they were finished just kind of reviewing which ones uh, which ones i might put forward for the exhibition uh, i called that one confluence because to me it has a very sort of strong divide here which reminds me of a place another site that i draw quite often where there are two um, two rivers that come together uh, so i like that idea of the kind of flow okay so that's the rivers of oak that's my charcoal series and i made those between um, kind of October and end of November, December time. And, uh, and then we had a lot of snow here. I'm not sure about where you are, but we had, we had quite a lot of snow and quite a lot of cold. Um, and what I've noticed is that my work is very much affected by the season. And there are certain things that I like to do in certain seasons. And that's just, I'm just, I'm still learning that to be honest. So this is my studio in the snow. So that's where I am just now, but on a very different kind of day. I've got flowers and birds and people doing DIY outside and all sorts of things now. It's very different then. But you will remember in January, not only was it cold and, uh, and dark, it was also really depressing. There was really not an awful lot to feel happy about and there wasn't, wasn't an awful lot else to do. So I focused on work. But what I felt like I wanted to do. Oh, yeah, there we, I put that one. I forgot to put that one in. We have pheasants coming to the garden quite often. That one seemed to be quite taken with my wellies. Don't know why. <laughs> Came to say hello. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that I decided to do in January was to um, launch an online drawing course because I had some people who were interested in learning to draw, and it was a time where um, you know I felt like I needed to do something which connected me with other people rather than just. Um, just working away in the studio. So I started teaching that online and that took quite, basically most of January to, to develop that and start running that. Um, and that's uh, the second course is almost finished now. So that was a, a, a little bit of a, a diversion, if you like, but it was a great opportunity for me to review everything that I've learned about drawing and think about what would be useful to teach other people. Um, as you can probably tell, drawing is my absolute passion. And the other thing that I wanted to do as uh, I suppose as a bit of a response to that dark um, kind of depressing feeling was to do some color. So I'd been through a period of working in, um, in monochrome uh, and I really wanted to bring some color into the work. So I decided to revisit a series that I began last year in the first lockdown, a series of um, Phoenix trees uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, a series of Phoenix trees in oil paint, oil pastel and soft pastel. So I needed some colour, but I also needed some some of the, the kind of regeneration ideas that, that came through with the Phoenix trees. Now, apologies for the quality of this. This was a little trial, but I thought it might be quite interesting if you've never, never come across the, the Phoenix tree idea. I'll keep playing it again. I've not got it on a loop. Uh, so a phoenix tree is one which has fallen or been uh, blown over or collapsed. And um, it's, it, it, rather than dying, it still has some roots in contact with the ground and it continues to grow and it continues to live. It just re, readjusts to a horizontal position. Uh, the branches turn upwards towards the light this is an example, um, again, one of the Oaks and Dalkeith of um, a phoenix tree. Now, when you first come across that, it's really quite hard to understand. But um, this is the original trunk. This is the original root plate. And um, you can't see it, but here there's, there's a very large root that's still, um, still well attached to the ground and other, and other roots on this side. And what the tree has done is channeled all its energy into this branch here. So it's, uh, I've got a little video, I'll play the whole thing, but 
um, just I found really that it was such a complex tree that video was the only way to to get a bit of a sense of it. So you can see that there's um, a very strange, almost rotten looking um, structure horizontally on the ground and then one main branch as if a tree is growing out of that. So this is why they're called phoenix trees, because they, you know, kind of not, not necessarily rising from ashes, but they, you know, they arise from what is apparently um, something quite catastrophic. But if the tree is left alone, it's possible that it will do this. So, uh, so I, I went on the hunt for phoenix trees. Now we weren't allowed to travel very far. So that really forced me to look close to home and um, perhaps look in places that I hadn't really thought of looking. So all of these trees are, are very local to me. Um, and this is one of the ones that I found. Uh, it's a beech tree, which um, was formerly part of a, a farming landscape. It would have been, um, it would have been a boundary or hedgerow tree. Um, you can see that it's, it's tilted and this huge big root plate that's sticking up here, but there's still plenty of roots in contact with the ground and the tree is beginning to adjust. I don't think it's too long since that fell. Um, this, this was the first time that I'd found it, so I, I couldn't tell anything else behind it, but it's on an old stone dike, so it's on what would have been a boundary and surrounded by a conifer plantation now. Um, this is another phoenix tree. Um, I've got a drawing of that in a minute I can show you, which my, um, my six-year-old apprentice, my granddaughter, um, she found that for me, so I've, I've uh, managed to get her excited about trees and drawing, and uh, she found this amazing tree, which, again, quite similar. It's growing next to a watercourse. It's fallen here. The, you know, the, the, the crown would have been somewhere here. That's long gone, and then new trees have grown up from it. And what I find so interesting about that is just it's such a complicated form, it's, and it's and it's just so much of a challenge to draw. Um, I, I, I think this tree is absolutely brilliant. Okay, so again, we're, I kind of went through the sketchbook stage, working on thumbnails, um, working from um, previous sketches that I'd done in the field, looking at the photographs that I had and the video that I had. Uh, and uh, if I just kind of scroll through that quite quickly. So again, you know, it doesn't always start like this, but um, but that's what I decided to do this year was to to work in a series. So be a bit more ambitious than just working on one at a time to get um, to get a bit more of a, a, a group of work. And this is a kind of preliminary sketch for um, based on the first one that I showed you in Dalkeith. That's a different view of it. Um, so I'm just trying to get an idea about which compositions work. This is to show you the setup that I've got. Um, so you can see here that I've got my sketches, I've got some of the photographs, I've got my kind of oil painting stuff, brushes and things. I, they always start with drawing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the difference is between drawing and painting. I've yet to find anybody who can definitively tell me. Um, but I, as far as I understand it, I think it's just a feeling. You just know when it feels like painting and you know when it feels like drawing. And for me, most of the time, it feels like I'm drawing I, and, and most of my work starts with a drawing. So that's the, the kind of beginning. And then this is the, um, the underpainting stage. So I've used a very thin wash of oil paint here to get the, um, a little bit of the element of, of the form. So it gets a little bit of tone in, but also just to give it a bit more life, something to, to respond to with, um, when I start adding the pastels. That's another view of the same tree where that's kind of tilted over. And what I really loved about these trees was the moss. And that's really what drew me um, particularly to do these in the, in the winter was the, the kind of lusciousness of the moss, the, the feeling of them being really soft. So that's what I've tried to get into the drawings, drawings slash paintings, because these look like paintings now, don't they? But they did start out like drawings, who knows? Um, so these are different, four different views of that tree. And that's one of the finished ones. So that's um, with the addition of oil pastel. 
Um, it's quite a small one, that one. So I did a se little series of four from that. Well, that's another one kind of close up. So hopefully you can see there, you know, it's quite a small scale, uh, fairly broad marks, but the, I was really just enjoying the colors there. Those, those greens and the, the kind of bluey gray of the lichen, uh, the great colors. And that's uh, another phoenix tree, um, quite close to completion, I think. And um, that's also just to show you my setup with the soft pastels. So I've got, um, I use unison pastels, which are incredibly intense colors. Really, they're really fantastic quality pastels. Um, I've not really found any to better them, uh, but they are really expensive. So I look after them as far as I can. Um, yeah, make sure they don't all get uh, jumbled up and end up the same color. So this is, and um, you probably recognize that from one of the earlier sketches of that tree. And just do a quick time lapse of that. So it's um, it's quite a slow process. It's slower than the charcoal, I think, um, for these works, because there's the added layer of complexity of, of making decisions about color. Um, but very absorbing and, and felt quite uplifting at the time to do. Um, and I put this one in because one of, the, um, one of the things that I really enjoyed in those months was being able to attend webinars um, and talks and things where I could learn and, and connect with other people who understand trees and the history of them. And uh, the man that you see on the screen is somebody called Ted Green, who is uh, a long time campaigner, activist, um, kind of leader in his field in terms of ancient trees. He's one of the founder members of the Ancient Tree Forum. He's, uh, he's uh, infamous for talking for a very long time and never staying on the topic that he's been given for the talk, but that doesn't really matter. He was given free reign in this one. It was um, hosted by the Arboricultural Association. They've been doing loads of free webinars online. So if you're at all interested in that, that kind of area, definitely look them up. So what was so marvelous, like I've, I've heard him talk in uh, conferences and things in, in person as well. What was so marvelous is that I could, I could be um, finishing this drawing of an, a tree that I understand because of him and people like him uh, whilst listening to him talk. That was something that was really quite special. And uh, again just to, just to show you you can see the the underpainting and I use layers with the soft pastels and fix in between the papers prepared with um, a clear gesso so that's um, a surface which has got quite a bit of tooth to it it's sort of gritty and that means that the pastel um, powder the, the pigment will actually stick to the paper uh, much better okay and then um, so that was my, my Phoenix series. Uh, I kind of came to ground to a bit of a halt with those. I think when um, it was probably around about March and really what, what was desperate to do was to get back out into the woods again. Now, normally I would spend, you know, kind of February, March, well, as much time as possible drawing out in the woods, uh, but we weren't able to travel then. Um, and, uh, and it was, and it was, frustrating but that's that's the way it had to be so what I did is I started doing a bit of playing with some different materials and one of them was Conte crayon and sanguine which is the kind of reddish material that you saw earlier and um, as I said earlier I started exploring woodlands that's much closer to home um, we've got a little family collection of hammocks so we had some hammock days um, out in the early spring which was really reviving and um, a lot of fun and um, these woodland drawings resulted from those. Um, so these are made uh, again on paper, like all the other work with um, Conti crayon and Sanguine in a pencil form. So that's, that, that's the, the pencil. I started again, started playing in the sketchbook. Um, it's kind of textbook process this, I realize this now, it doesn't always work that way. It just happens to. So for those of you who are artists and feeling guilty about your lack of sketchbooks, please don't, because it doesn't always work for people. Um, and quite often I use just scraps of paper for getting those ideas out rather than putting it in, in a sketchbook. Um, and I was experimenting with trying to get that feeling of motion. So again, I was trying to carry that movement through from the Rivers of Oak series 
um, trying to get that movement into the drawings, but in a way that I could do actually in the woodland. And I stuck with the phoenix tree theme. I stuck with that idea and, uh, and again went and kind of sought out various um, trees nearby. I'm quite lucky where we are that we've, we have three quite large estates within um, easy traveling distance. This is on one of them. So this is a, a horse chestnut, which is by the shore. Um, you just see the bridge there in the, in the background. Um, so this is a horse chestnut, which um, this would have been the original trunk. It's split, it's fallen and is layering. So phoenixing down towards the shore. So all of these areas here, it's, it's taken root and there's a whole Kind of cluster of new trees that are growing up really fascinating tree um so i did quite a bit of sketching uh with that one and uh just quick quick flick through some of the sketches this is to show you some sketches that you wouldn't normally see now i wouldn't i wouldn't show anybody these because these don't really make an awful lot of sense they're certainly not pictures they're not satisfying pictures but they are essential for me to understand the form of the tree for me to take that into the next drawing. Um, so it's really me getting to know the tree. And that's one of the finished drawings. In the exhibition, um, if you're able to see it in person or online, um, I've shown pairs of drawings of each tree. So you'll see the same title and it will say north or south or east or west. Um, so I've shown them in pairs, two different viewpoints of the same tree. And I took that idea a little bit further with this one. Um, this is a, a yew tree in the grounds of uh, an old church, as they often are. And it's such a complicated form. What I did was do five different, <clears throat> five different viewpoints, <clears throat> excuse me, five viewpoints um, on five separate pieces of paper. So you'll see those um, in the exhibition as well. And this is really, this is me, as I said, sorry, this is me, as I said, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to know the tree when I'm doing this kind of work. I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to make a picture that's satisfying. I, there's a little bit of a fight with myself mentally that I, I have to stop myself asking, is this a good picture? Because that gets in the way. This is a, a, a dialogue with the tree. It's me slowing down to tree time, really. That's how I think about it. Slowing down and then really, really looking. So all my work is, um, all my work starts with observational drawing. There's a lot of that feeds into your visual memory because I've been doing this for quite a while. You know, I've got an understanding of how a yew tree grows in comparison to how a beech tree grows, for instance. But um, without being able to do this stage, the rest of the work just wouldn't happen. Um, and this is an example of a really, really just wonderful phoenix tree. Um, you can see, so it's lying down. It kind of looks as if it's if, as if it might be dead, but it's not. It's sprouting up uh, along the top. And then that's one of the drawings that I made from that one. I made quite a few of those. It's a fantastic tree. But again, very complicated. You can see that you know it's it's not a it's not a portrait as such. It's just impossible to capture that amount of detail. Uh, it's this such a complex thing. What I'm trying to do here is uh, imagine it as a living thing and try and respond to that living thing that's in front of me. Right, and that's another example in the same woodland, which is um, in West Lothian, a place called Calderwood, which is a little ancient woodland site that's. Um, still managed to be fairly quiet uh, during lockdown, which is an absolute pleasure. Uh, so I spent I spent the spring kind of March, end of March, April sort of time working outside. Sometimes it rains and it ruins my drawing because the paper doesn't really like getting wet, but um, they don't always make it out of the studio, but it's a really important part of the process. Um, so you can see there that the, the sort of uh, scale of it and I'm trying to get that movement in there and that's it in front of the tree so this is a sycamore tree what you can't see in the photograph is that 
uh, towards the left hand side the branches just go on and on and layer and uh, turn into all sorts of uh, new trees as well <clears throat> and this is just a little just to give you a little bit of an idea about the way that I draw and I, I don't particularly think about it but um, one of the things that people think you know when they're thinking about learning how to draw is well how do you how do you hold the pencil well or you know whatever tool it is that you're using to draw well there are lots of different ways of doing it there's no right and wrong way but this this way I don't know it almost feels like holding a chisel or something instead but this seems to be the way that um, I find most satisfying to draw the, the tree when I'm actually sitting in front of it uh, it's not and that's it in front of that's this is the one that my granddaughter found as well um okay so that's uh that's really kind of coming up to you know the last month or so this is just a little shot of my studio um i'm packing to set up set up the exhibition I, i'm stacking up the work uh, i've shown most of the work unframed uh, for two reasons really one that um because I wasn't really sure whether it was going to be a physical exhibition or an online exhibition, I, I, I wasn't sure whether it was going to be um, a good idea to frame it. But also it means that when people are buying it, if they're not in Edinburgh, it's quite easy to ship to them um, and then they can arrange framing as well. So that was kind of twofold reason. So that's what you'd see if you went to the exhibition. And, uh, and that's just a shot of me looking quite pleased with myself because I've actually managed to hang an exhibition and it's quite a long time since I did it and I had absolutely no idea if I would manage it. Uh, to be honest it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a shock to um, to go kind of out in the world quite so quickly and talk to so many people where you know I hadn't really done that um, for quite a long time. I enjoy talking to people, I like doing exhibitions but um, I was pretty rusty. I just realised I'm wearing the same shirt there. I do have more than one shirt, just so you know. <laughs> okay. So the exhibition um, is on until next Sunday. Uh, uh, so it's on in uh, Edinburgh Palace at Margaret's house. That's the east of Edinburgh. Um, things are a bit complicated at the moment. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to Edinburgh Palette for hosting it. I used to have my studio at Edinburgh Palette. Um, I had a studio there for about nine years. It was a fantastic place to, to grow my work and develop and meet a big artist network. Um, so it, it's a great, it's a great um, pleasure to be back there exhibiting. And it's a really lovely gallery space. It's not, not the easiest place to find despite being an eight story building. But, um, but, but once you're in, it's, it's a really interesting place. Um, so uh, I was just going to stop that share and share my desktop. No, here we are, that one. Okay, so just to show you, hopefully you can see that okay. Uh, on my website, if you want to find out how to visit the exhibition, there's an information page. So this was kind of an extra thing that I needed to do for the for the exhibition because it was it's a bit of a hybrid. It's both online and uh, and a physical one. Uh, so that's got the visiting times and the venue details. Um, it's going to be open Friday, Saturday, Sunday for drop in. And I'm also doing some private visits. Most of those are booked, but I'm also doing virtual visits as well. So if you're too far away and you want a virtual visit, there's a place that you can book that. And then if you want to view the exhibition online, then there's an, a separate exhibition page that has um, a bit of the text and the kind of description about it, and then all the individual works, which you can view there. Now I know, I'll stop that share, and so I can see you and see your questions. Um, so I know that um, it's not quite the same seeing it online was not anything like the same seeing 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 it on a screen is nothing like the same as seeing it in person but really what i've tried to do is give you the best kind of taste but the the kind of close-up view of the virtual tours is quite good and um and i'm also putting together a video so that you can see that um just kind of in your own time um okay so i'm going to um oh Somebody says not got any sound. 
Hmm. No, but everybody has had sound, haven't they? Yes. Good. <laughs> Good. I hope. I hope Sarah managed to get some sound there. Um, so let's. Uh, there we go. Let's go through the questions. So what got me interested in drawing trees in the first place? Very good question. Um, I, uh, I've always enjoyed drawing natural forms. I've had a strong dislike of drawing straight lines ever since I was at art college and was made to draw a canal, which I found really boring. Um, so natural forms are definitely um, appealing to me. My dad was a wood turner and he made things out of wood. Um, he, uh, so I made things out of wood as well. I, I went to do my degree. Um, and it, it just it seemed to be a subject which I kept going back to. And I, I used to work in a theatre, and um, I, I, you know, I ended up making painting sets that had tree roots and things on that. So looking back, it's something that I that I did quite, you know, quite a long way back. But when I started making the kind of work that I'm making now, about kind of 10, 11 years ago, it really came to the point where I had to. I felt I had to just pick one thing. I had to pick pick a subject or pick a medium, pick a material and focus because um, prior to that, I'd been doing community arts work. I'd been making mosaics and banners and, uh, you know, big drawings and publications, all sorts of things. Jack of all trades, master of none. So really, I felt when I first got my studio that I, that I wanted to focus and trees was a thing that I enjoyed um, I enjoyed looking at, but also learning about. And I, I thought it's a subject that I'll never get bored with. And I'm, I'm confident that that's the case. I don't know how many, how many more decades I've got to be doing this, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that I won't ever get bored with doing trees. Um, so somebody's got an ancient oak in their back meadow. Wow, oh, lucky you, amazing. I don't see your name. It just, it just says iPhone, so. Um, which type of paper do I use with a sanguine? Uh, and what do I use as charcoal fixative? Uh, I use, um, it's a Canson paper, Canson, Canson Mitant pastel paper. Uh, it's got two different surfaces. On one side, it's got a kind of honeycomb surface. On the other side, it's quite smooth. Um, uh, so I quite like the versatility of it. And th there's a very wide range of color options as well. So I found one that worked really well with the sanguine as a, as a nice kind of warm, uh, a warm tone to it. Um, the paper that I use for charcoal is, uh, is also a Canson paper. Uh, it's a, it's a, a different kind of white cartridge type paper, but a, but a heavy duty one. Uh, so again, I did lots of experimentation, found one that I liked, and I tend to stick with that one because um, I, I kind of know what it will do most of the time. Um, and the charcoal fixative, I have. There we go. That's the brand that I've got at the moment. Um, it's a it's an LEA one that I use. I've tried various different kinds. There's one that I've yet to trial, which is. Um, a non-toxic one, which I'm quite excited about. It's a casein-based one, which I've recently come across called Spectrafix. Um, but I tend not to use a huge amount of fixative. I tend to use a light, um, a kind of light passive fixative and several coats, several light coats, because what I find is it sort of dulls the charcoal quite a lot. So, um, so I need to, it's a balance between fixing it and not um, destroying it. Uh, oh, Sarah says that she's sorted halfway. So, um, so hopefully that's given you a bit of an insight into um, into how I make the work. Um, and obviously, you you know where to go and have a look if you want to see the finished works. But I think it's always interesting to hear a little bit about what's behind it. Uh, if you've got any more questions. Um, you could fire them into the chat, or if you think of something afterwards and you want to get in touch. Um, you can just email me. My contact details are on the website as well. Um, it'd be lovely to, to hear from you, get a bit of feedback. These things are always a bit weird because I don't hear anybody. So <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed it um, and, uh, and got something out of it. But if you're anything like me, you'll think of something later on and then you'll think, oh, I don't want to bother her. But it wouldn't be bothering me. It would be, um, it would be a pleasure to answer your questions or just to um, 